Welcome to Life Science Today, your source for stories, insights, and trends across the life science industry. I'm your host, Dr. Noah Goodson. This week, technology for inclusion, layoffs, oncology approvals, and $200 million for a tech platform. The views expressed on Life Science Today are those of the host and guests. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any organizations with which they are affiliated. In the United States, clinical trial enrollment remains perennially low in certain populations. Challenges in recruiting participants exist for many reasons, including access to information and proximity to major research centers. These forces tend to impact rural, poor, and historically marginalized communities in a disproportionate fashion. Many estimates suggest that only 4 to 5% of all trial participants in the U.S. studies are black compared to 13.4% of the U.S. population. While these are not the same across all indications, many of the studies that are very successful in recruiting black participants are for specific indications, like sickle cell disease or other areas of research like psychiatry. So how do we increase enrollment of these and other historically marginalized communities? Some organizations claim that moving to digital solutions can make a major impact. And emerging data from various studies shows that adding a more digitally connected clinical trial design can have a meaningful impact on who enrolls in a study. For example, researchers from Duke University completed a study with almost 8,000 participants. In one group, they utilized video during the informed consenting process, while the other group had only traditional paper consenting. The results showed a statistically significant increase in rural, non-white, and elderly participants when video consent was used. Additionally, there was a 39-day shortening of first patient enrollment. Past consenting, evidence suggests that replacing study visits with telehealth and completing assessments on smartphones are just a few practical innovations that decrease barriers to research access. All of this can lead companies to make claims that seem to suggest technology is going to solve inclusiveness issues. However, I think it's important to acknowledge that many of the resistors to clinical trial enrollment particularly among historically marginalized communities in the United States, are deeply rooted in long-standing inequities. Just last week, data again surfaced from a major pharmaceutical company funding studies in which black participants who were prisoners were injected with the known carcinogen asbestos for $10. And by the way, this was in 1971. The company in question did follow all standards at the time for consenting, but I doubt if any of us would argue that that makes this study ethical. My point is that low enrollment from a population may often have complex reasons beyond even the current delivery of healthcare. Indeed, there are a ton of papers on how social structures impact clinical care and interest in research. Technology that makes consenting, clinical trial activities, and engagement better can take us a long way. So can listening to participants and actually implementing their feedback into our study designs. But even if we do all that, participation in clinical research may be a huge request for any participant who tries an experimental medication or medical device. And it might be helpful to take a look in the mirror and realize that perhaps there's a good reason some populations distrust our industry. It's obvious that leveraging technology will meaningfully improve the way we collect data in studies. Let's not imagine that technical implementation alone is sufficient to override meaningful objections grounded in all too present history of social inequity and abuse of power. Gilead has announced they're laying off 114 employees at their Morris Plains facility, which was acquired in 2020 with the $21 billion acquisition of Immunomedics. The company was acquired on big hopes for the anti-trope 2 oncology antibody, Trodelvi. In 2021, the drug brought in just $380 million, but there's continued uptake as global launch proceeds. It's not clear that this move is really related to Trodelvi performing poorly or a larger plan to just cut some bottom line. In many ways, this is par for the course for large company acquisitions. 
acquire, integrate, lay off or sell excess assets, and redirect assets into highest value. This may not be comforting for those laid off, but I don't currently see it as an indicator of big challenges at Gilead. More a normal acquisition cycle. AstraZeneca and Merck have earned approval for their collaboration on the breast cancer drug to be sold as Linparza. The targeted adjuvant therapy has been approved for a specific subpopulation of oncology patients with HER2 negative early breast cancer. The high risk population saw a 32% reduction in death compared to control in a phase three trial. If you're not familiar with the oncology language, adjuvant therapies are given after the removal of a tumor or other tissue to treat cancer to try and prevent the spread and hopefully destroy any cancerous tissue that remains. They also tend to have significant side effects, and Limparza is no exception here, with a long list of notable and highly uncomfortable side effects. The germline BCRA mutation that leads to this form of early and aggressive cancer must be detected via genetic test. Thus, the FDA simultaneously approved Myriad Genetics BRCA analysis CDX test. The test can be used to distinguish between germline BRCA1 and BRCA2 and can lead to early recognition of risk as well as provide a gateway for treatment with Linparza. All told, taking Linparza is unlikely to be pleasant, but it does provide hope of extended life. In its third significant funding round since 2019, DNA Nexus has raised $200 million from Blackstone. The data analytics software company is building a platform centered around AI-driven genomics analysis and insight. Although genomics was their core business, the platform spans a wide range of services that may need tech enablement and integration in the life science industry, including genomics analysis for pipelines, multiomics and mixed data sets, and regulatory GXP support. Now, with $68 million in 2019, $100 million in 2020, and this latest infusion, they are primarily focused on increasing commercial rollout, driving their product roadmap, and increasing cross-functional integration. Companies like DNA Nexus with data and analytics solutions that are broad enough to meet pharma and biotech developmental needs continue to see major success. As we see financial setbacks and a need to refresh pipelines, Organizations that promise to use data to accelerate discovery and speed go no go decisions have a leg up. While we're certainly developing more technically advanced medications, it's not clear to me if we've accelerated the process from bench to bedside. Thanks for joining me for Life Science Today, your source for stories, insights, and trends across the life science industry. Learn more at lifesciencetodaypodcast.com. If you like what you hear, please tell a friend. Once again, I'm Dr. Noah Goodson. I'll see you next week.